Welcome to the uh, Sean Kelly on Movies uh, podcast, and uh, this is a um, special uh, double episode where I will um, present uh, my uh, remaining um, interviews from the uh, Fantasia Film Festival from uh, earlier this year. So uh, first up will be um, with uh, directors Hannah Barlow and Kane Sens for the uh, film Sissy. Uh, which was actually my uh, favorite film from uh, Fantasia Do This Year. And the uh, film is uh, now available to stream on Shudder. And it has been on the streaming service since uh, September 29th. Uh, then uh, next would be uh, my um, interview with uh, director Casey Carthew and star uh, Viva Lee for the uh, film Polaris, uh, which will be having its uh, Toronto premiere this week at the uh, Blood in the Snow Film Festival. So I hope you enjoy these interviews. Warning, our interview for Sissy contains some spoilers. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, where did the uh, idea for Sissy come from? Uh, we There were lots of... Um points of inspiration. I think the film touches upon childhood bullying, social media, the consequences of uh, social media on millennial and Gen Z mental health, uh, self-victimization, being prophetized through social media. Uh, so all of those things were, yeah, big draw cards for us as writers. And then, you know, on a personal level, um, the consequences of not clearing your childhood wounding, I think, is universal. So, mm. yeah. And they're just wanting to make a fun slasher film out of yes. all of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's well, yeah. so um, what were some of the um, influences on the film? Um, well, I guess it's a kind of uh, meeting in the middle of, you know, um, Y2K kind of female friendship uh, com- comedies, c- coming of age films, kind of um, whether it be Bridesmaids or Muriel's Wedding. Crossroads. Crossroads and then kind of um, clashing that, I guess, up against, you know, Carrie and single white female um, and many, many slasher movies, um, you know, whether it be kind of uh, Halloween or the Friday the 13th series all the way up to kind of Scream and, and um, kind, of, kind of the 90s version of the slasher. I mean, it's, yeah, there's, ma- there's many influences, um, not all obvious ones, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, in a very weird way, I kind of got like a, I spit on my grave vibe, not because of the rape part, but because of the revenge part. Yeah. 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 That's very interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I guess, I guess, I mean, well, that's a compliment. I mean, <laughs> that's such a I, iconic film, but, um, yeah, I mean, revenge, revenge narratives are fun. You know, mm-hmm. we all have kind of that fantasy in us that we want to get even with our bullies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why those movies work so well. Uh, I mean, a big part of it was kind of like, what if Muriel's Wedding? I don't know if, if you seen I haven't Muriel's seen Muriel's Wedding. Wedding. It's, uh, it's, I know it's Tony Collette. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's an Australian classic that we all grew up with. It's on TV. Like it was on TV every weekend. Like, every Friday night. And you grow up thinking it's a broad comedy and that's how it's pitched. But it's actually really, really dark. Yeah. So. And not to give anything away about the film, but kind of what would happen uh, in Muriel's Wedding, for example, if, uh, if Muriel got revenge on all the mean girls. And that's, that's I think, where... That's, I think, in many ways where Sissy comes from. Okay, so um, so how difficult for you was to strike a balance between um, Cecilia being a sympathetic character and, and someone who's maybe a little off kilter? <laughs> well, I think that we all have that duality existing within us as individuals. Um, we There are parts of us that are likable and accessible and open and expanding. Uh, and there are also parts of us and we tend to hide those parts that are flawed and destructive and catastrophic and catastrophizing and self-sabotaging. But what we're presenting online all the time is the filtered best portfolio version. So, you know, if we're going to make, if we're going to make a film or talk about these sort of consequences of, um, social media on us as a generation, the character has to be, uh, emblematic of both, 
uh, the good and the bad parts of Instagram and TikTok and all of that. So um, I think if you, I, I think people like Cecilia, I think they agree with her. I think they want to see her get away with her fantasy, her revenge fantasy, because we all have one. Mm-hmm. We just hide it better than she does. And we don't necessarily act on it <laughs> the way that she does, but uh, we're turning the dial up on those um, dark aspects of our personality. Well, that, that's that's why we watch films, right? Because we get to see characters do the things that we can't do in yeah. real life. So, and then there's um, uh, Cecilia's friendship with um, Emma, which is one of the driving forces in the plot. And uh, so the question is raised in the film whether they were truly that close or if, um, as Cecilia suggested at one point, that Emma's just feeling pity for her. Yeah. yeah. I think that a lot of female friendships, a lot of young women go through the same thing, which is the, the first heartbreak as, as, a, as a girl um, is with your best friend. We all go through that period where you're intoxicated by this other person. They've become a part of your identity, your everything. You know, that first friendship is so palpable. And then the cool girl comes along and drives a wedge between you and that person. And it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And we wanted to capture that. But, you know, is is it reciprocated? Is it a, a reciprocated relationship? We're not sure. You, when you see Emma run into Cecilia at the, the chemist, um, you think it is. But Emma's like, a, I think she, we think she's the villain of the movie. She is inconsistent. She's unreliable. She's not accountable. Um, and well, Alex is the clear bully, but she is at least honest. And we have this sort of like triangle of friendship, which is really common for, for young girls. So, yeah. At, at the same time, you know, like you, you can't control how other people treat you. You can only control how you react. And so, you know, um, sure, Emma and Alex are in many ways at fault for how they treat Cecilia, but it's really up to Cecilia to have self responsibility, have self responsibility and accountability, and 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 um, instead of just suppressing those feelings, only for them to I guess come out in these bursts of of rage, rage um, or whatnot, um, it, it would probably be better for her to you know really kind of to to practice the mindfulness, um, which is what she's preaching. Which which is ironically what she's preaching, but sometimes it's a lot easier to uh, to give advice than than to apply it to yourself, right? So. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Alex because when she's introduced, she's pretty much, from Cecilia's perspective, a full-on villain. But as the film progresses, you start to wonder if maybe the feelings Alex had about Cecilia might not be that far off. So how did you go about writing the character? Oh, I think, yeah, she, it, she is the clear villain. Um I think it came from a place of pondering the things that people say about you, the criticisms that they have or the rejection that you experience as a young person because not everybody's going to like you. Mm. Um, the things that cut deep that, that the, you don't like about yourself that someone actually kind of, that the they seeds, verbalize, you know? It's, it stays with you. It sticks to you. It, it, it forms your personality in, in a sense and it's up to you to not attach to those criticisms. But... Mm. Yeah, Alex, Alex is right about Cecilia, but only because Cecilia allows it, only because she kind of leans into that perception and mm. allows it to control her. So that was kind of the inspiration. She's not, she's not necessarily right in how she goes about it and how she treats Cecilia mm-hmm. because there's no real need to bully anybody ever. But, um, but she does have a view of Cecilia that I think Cecilia kind of deep, deep, deep down probably uh, is insecure about in the first place. But it's it. the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. Because if she yeah. hadn't bullied Cecilia as a young person, Cecilia might not have reacted and she might not have evolved into this like super villain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so pretty much one of the, the, the ultimate theme of the film is how uh, bullying can affect someone's mental health with the film obviously going to the biggest extremes. Yeah. So um, <laughs> do you think Cecilia would have been better off if she actually sought real therapy instead of becoming a social media influencer, which uh, actually seems to be a toxic outlet of self-gratification? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 I think so. I think I think there's never anything. Uh, there's never any downside to um, self introspection and kind of like confronting yourself in the mirror with a and, professional. 
with a professional and doing some work on yourself, you know, I don't think, um, I don't think we kind of want to necessarily say that there's anything intrinsically wrong uh, with mental health advocacy online, because if, if, you know, some young kid who doesn't maybe have access or, 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 or know how to approach a therapist can, can come upon something on social media that is helpful, then that, that's, that's not a bad thing. You know, you'd kind of rather they be thinking about their mental health and their mindfulness uh, rather than just kind of, uh, you know, increasing their comparison anxiety from looking at swimsuit models and whatnot. Worshipping the Kardashians. Wor- worshipping kind of um, ultimately a kind of toxic um, kind of view of themselves. But at the same time, you have to be very careful because who, these people that are influencers and that are in these positions of power online, like who put them there and and what what qualifies them to have that kind of influence, especially on young minds. So I think um, it's a mixed bag and it's uh, it's a fine line but i do think um you know one day hopefully mental health uh mental education will be on the same level uh from uh from say from uh uh, school uh, as as physical education is i mean we all grow up with kind of phys ed but do we grow up with mental ed you know uh, our society is very behind in that way, but I think I think we are pushing in the right direction um, with kind of men- mental health awareness in the last I don't know five or so years. Um, so it's it's a good thing, um, but the but the the online space is still a very um, unregulated be, exactly p- potentially portal. potentially yeah. dangerous place. Very dangerous. Yeah. So as long as we're aware of that, um, no one's going to really kind of protect you from it other than yourself. So we kind of just the the more we talk about that stuff, the better. Well, thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Sean. Now here's my interview for Polaris having its Toronto premiere as part of the Blood and Snow Film Festival. How did you get the idea for Polaris? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, the idea came really, it was inspired by the story world created in a short film called Fish Out of Water. And really the elements there were the frozen north, these color palettes of white and gray and just kind of a little bit bleak looking. Um, and in that story world, there was a, uh, a woman and a young girl and there was maybe some body parts that were taken. And um, it was also primarily nonverbal film that had a fictional language. And it's actually fans who reached out to me and said, oh, we want to see this as a feature. And it took a took a little while because I was busy with some other things. But ultimately, I thought, you know, I love that story world. So let's let's figure out how to play in there. And then when I went to create the actual story, I really feel like I just talked <laughs> talked out loud to the universe and was like, what's 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 this story world? These are all the elements I want in there. And then I thought of a bear and I thought of Greek mythology and the little dipper and the big dipper. And I just kind of, the flow was there. It's it not always is the case for me. And it really was for, for me on this project. Yeah. Yeah. So actually I want to talk about the nonverbal aspect of the film. So th- that was your intention from the start? hundred percent. And, and I've also was really adamant that I don't want to see subtitles. The idea, it's primarily nonverbal, but when we do hear languages, they are fictional. And the intention is to show the world through the eyes of Sumi. And she is raised by a polar bear, so she doesn't speak a human language. So to me, it doesn't make sense that, you know, the audience would then also sort of know this language. The, the words and the, the, forms of communication used, I think are still really clear. Nobody's talking about philosophy. They're really like clearly about getting the prisoner doing, it's like very clear, uh, much like if you, you know, go to a country and you don't speak the language, you're, it's pretty clear if somebody's, you know, telling you off or saying nice things to you. So for me, that was always, always intentional. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what's the bit of the, the specific backstory of this world? Because um, one very obvious thing in the film is that all the characters are female. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't see the males, so we don't know. Did you have a thought about it? Not really. <laughs> so I created um, this as a even more ambitious project. I created it, it, in my mind, as a trilogy with Polaris being the second story. It's the, the sort of main 
story because it's a story of Sumi and it connects the other the other two story worlds. Uh, the first story is the backstory, uh, so to speak, and the third story follows uh, Frozen Girl's journey much closer. So uh, you'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. So um, how did uh, Viva get involved? Um. Well. I auditioned for the first round of auditions and then nothing really happened. And then I auditioned the second time. It's a crazy story actually. I pulled out my ottomans, but they have wheels on the bottom of them. So I stuck rubber flip flops underneath them and I was jumping on them and I was screaming and yelling and I was like scratching near the camera. It's totally crazy. I was like, let's just do this for fun since, you know, it's different, it's animalistic. And then I got a callback. <laughs> um, the callback, think I think it went pretty well. It went okay, you know. Uh, it, was, it went okay. Uh, we had a lot of a lot of. Uh, Viva was eleven when she played played Sumi, and we had a lot of kids audition. And there's so many wonderful actors out there, but it really felt like, to Viva's point, she's just so um, self aware but in the way that like she can be let it go she can go all over the place do anything with her voice it's it's kind of a fearless thing that uh, i really really respect it because as a director once she's cast in the role it's hers like she's and i need to know that somebody's gonna be like all Crazy. over the place and viva's all of that so thank you yeah <laughs> no it's, i'm so proud of your performance yeah thank you uh, so could you um, talk a bit about working with a polar bear in the film? <laughs> yeah, well, the polar bear is uh, an amazing animal, um, very exclusive. Uh, we have only know of one professional polar bear working in, at least in North America and, and Western Europe. And this is Aggie. She's um, been a working actor her whole life since she was a cub, and she's now just retired. I think she's about 27 or 28 years old. Um, because of COVID, actually, just like all actors, when sets got shut down, she couldn't work for for over a year. And um, her trainer said that he thinks she was sad about that. So actually, when we went to film with her, uh, she was super excited. She was super excited to roll around in the snow and play. And that, that basically is the first scene of the film that you see. Um, but working with her is extraordinary. She eats a lot of food. That's how she's uh kind of you know she's bribed into doing things and it's fascinating to watch she gets she got given a lot of treats and uh including croissants and she's a very bougie uh bougie uh, bear you know she she knows what she wants so she um you know she's an actor like anybody else and she has her um needs and wants and she has her style of acting too so it's it's pretty interesting because she genuinely is a a, a performer yeah Mm -hmm. and, uh, any additions? Um, no. <laughs> um, I never got to work with the polar bear, um, but uh, I did. No, I worked with the polar bear. I totally did. Um, movie magic. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I know everything. Um, she was my best friend. Filmed with her the entire time. Even if she wasn't in a scene, she was right beside me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, well, speaking of magic, how would you um, describe the, like, the use of magic in the film? Because I kind of found that, like, Sumi kind of, like, uses magic in, like, a matter-of-fact manner. Like, she, like, knew how to use it all her life. So, how would you describe that? I think it is shown in a matter-of-fact way. We don't see her discover it. We we right away see that she has a connection to the North Star and uh, which is which is Polaris. Polaris is the North Star and we see her making these gestures. And um, so for me, that's just sort of one of the, the rules of this world that I right away wanted everyone to be really clear about. Like she can do this and she follows the North Star, but nobody else does. Nobody else in the film even seems to see the North Star and um, nobody else seems to know about this. The only person who is very curious about it, who we see is D, um, as sort of an ally, someone who's a morad who becomes an ally for, uh, for Sumi. And she has 
the same tattoos uh, that Sumi has on on her hands. She has it sort of like a poster on her on her wall, and I think we understand that there is a huge significance to this um, to this star. And the whole film is a fantasy film, and and part of it is that use of magic. I mean, I love fantasy stories. There. There's always magic in them. There's always a sorcerer. There's always, or I shouldn't say always, but often, often. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, go uh, the, this is actually just came up for me. So um, you actually mentioned that um, Viva was 11 while filming. So the, the, while filming, did you kind of like have to work around the more violent moments of the film or was her <laughs> family okay with it? <laughs> <laughs> I love gore. <laughs> oh, I, maybe do you want to do you want to start with that? Or? Um. Well, my I am very protective of what I put into my my brain. Um. Mm -hmm. I mean, Common Sense Media and IMDb Parents Guide are like my best friend. I always search up stuff before I watch it. But I think because I am an actor and I know what goes on behind the scenes, I know that's like it's silicone with like corn syrup mixed with red food dye. I'm like. Okay, I know it's fake, and sometimes I can tell it's fake, but um, yeah, it just seems like not as bad for me, and I actually really enjoy to do gore like in films, like killing people, and it's very fun. So thank you. <laughs> well, and I would say too, we had um, uh, for for Viva playing Sumi, we had a, a photo double for you know. She, she, because we're aged, she can only work a limited number of hours in a day. So we had another actor to do sh shots where we're not seeing her face in particular. But we also had a stunt double for her. So some of the, some of the really big stunts were done by her stunt double. But what I wanted to say is, uh, Viva, who's naturally athletic, and and I feel like you're a stunt performer, at least officially now. I, I don't do know. Stunts. <laughs> um, but she, she so impressed our, um, our head of stunts mm -hmm. that. He he gave the green light for her to do some stunts and was super impressed. She she nailed them and you know um, stunts are no joke. It's all about the safety. So sure. if if uh, he hadn't thought that she was only going to be excellent at that, he never would have done the green light. And of course we made everything safe. You know her mom's on set, uh, but you know. Viva has that skill and that love for it too. I think I is love stunts so much. I do many different uh, martial arts. I do taekwondo, jujitsu, boxing. Um, <laughs> uh, I did some wushu before. Uh, I also do weapons like bow staff, sword, um, nunchucks, butterfly knife, etc. So I feel yeah. as though that Don't played a part her. into yeah. it. So I was like, I was like, ooh, I like this because there's not many rules for young girls to do stunts and to kill people so that was pretty fun <laughs> yeah true <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay so um uh what's uh, next for polaris after fantasia <laughs> We uh, we don't know. We um, we have uh, been invited to some film festivals. We're not uh, able to say which ones yet, just out of respect for the festivals. Um, but in Canada, we will have theatrical distribution here and in the U.S. as well. And those dates are to be determined. So we're really excited and super grateful to be able to you know, to share the film with uh, larger audiences. And, and hopefully, I mean, I know we all want COVID to be gone, so hopefully, you know, it ends right away uh, so people can see it on the big screen because it's such a difference when you see this film on the big screen and also when you hear it with an amazing surround sound system. And I think it, it helps you immerse yourself in the story. You know, you don't want to see Mad Max on your, I, I've watched it a thousand times, so I can watch it on a small screen, but the feeling in a theater uh, is really, one I, you know, wish for audiences. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any closing comments? <laughs> oh, no, I totally agree. A hundred percent. Um, when I was watching the film for the first time, it was my first time. Um, I got chills on my back. Like I was numb. It was insane. I was like, Oh my God, this is incredible. <laughs> I was in this, but still, Oh my God. I remember filming that scene, but it felt so entirely different. It was insane. <laughs> Movie magic. Movie, Movie magic. magic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you. <laughs> the Sean Keller Movies Podcast is a production of SKLMovies.com. 
Episodes and show notes can be found at skmoviespodcast.ca or skmmovies.substack.com. And you can subscribe V2S via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and where else podcasts are hosted. Support us by becoming a paid subscriber at skmmovies.substack.com.